Amen. So y'all ready to jump into this brand new series today? Amen. It's a mini series. We got two weeks, right? It's just a two week series. And to, uh, this series, we're going to be exploring the beautiful, uh, the gift of Christmas, because how many people know it's a, the real gift is Jesus? Amen. <clears throat> and how many people know that we can get distracted? We get so busy with the holidays that we forget the real reason for the season is Jesus, right? But the beautiful thing about Jesus, the real gift of Jesus is that he didn't just send a message. He blessed us with his presence. He came down to earth. How many people are grateful, right? You know, have you ever had a, have, have you ever had a text message? Somebody sends you a text message and they're like, I'm praying for you. But you're, you're, you're appreciative of that. But have you ever had somebody say, hey, I'm going to pray with you right now, right? Like, I'm, I'm going to pray with you. Or they send a text, hey, I'm here for you. If you need me, holla at me, right? H-M-U, hit me up, right? <laughs> right? They say, I'm, I'm there for you. See, Jesus could have sent a message through one of his prophets, right? And, and just said that, hey, I'm, I'm here for you guys. He could have left a couple Bible verses and said, I'm with you, right? But instead of just saying it to somebody, Jesus said, I'm going to get off my throne, and I'm going to come down to the earth, and I'm going to live life with them, and I'm going to show them what they could not do, I will do, so they can believe and trust in me as a Savior. How many people are grateful for a Savior that didn't just talk about it, right? He really walked this thing out. So, so that, that means that Jesus got off of his throne in, in, in all of his divinity, right? He is God. He is king, and he, he relinquishes all of that so he could come down in, in our humanity, which means that he experienced every single thing that we experience. Because how many people know that, that life can get hard, amen? Right, and Jesus experienced all the difficulties, all the struggles, all the things that we normally would face, Jesus faced it as well, and he did not fail. But it, what it means is that he experienced everything, our pain, right, and he was there for us, which means in turn, as a Christian, we should be there for other people just like Jesus was there for us. Right through the struggles, through pain, through sorrow, through sin, through, through, through mistakes, when people stumble, whenever they're having a good day and they're having a bad day. How many people know that we should still be there for them? Amen. And we also should be present with them, not just because you can be in the house and not be present. Right. Right. So so this the, the series is titled present. Right. The real present was God being present with us. And so what we want to do is to be present with other people, no matter what they're going through, no matter what the battle is, I'm going to be here with you. You know, like whenever you're in class and they call your name present, right? Whenever God calls on you so you can do something for him, come on, how many people want to say present? I'm here. I'm focused. I'm ready to do whatever you tell me to do. Send me. I'll go. Amen. All right. So let's jump in the word of God. Matthew chapter one, starting at verse 18. Somebody was asking me what Bible version I use and uh, the other day, and I thought about it. I want to tell you, I use the, most of the time I use the NLT. There's nothing special about it. But whenever I'm preaching, I feel like it explains it the easiest to the congregation. And, uh, but whenever I'm studying, I'll use the ESV or New King James or anything like that. But just if you wanted to change on your, uh, if you have your phone and you're on the Bible app, if you want to change it to NLT, you can, but it doesn't really matter. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, and the word of the Lord reads, <clears throat> This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary, his mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. Right? He was panicking, he was freaking out. You know, you're still a virgin. We're engaged. How are you pregnant? Right. And so he starts to develop this plan to divorce her. Verse 20. As he considered this, though, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David. Right. Got his attention. The angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit and she will have a son and you are to name him Jesus. Oh, come on, somebody. Come on. Right. That name of Jesus. Everything's about to change. Right. It's one of those. A word, you know how we say a word from God can literally change your whole life, right? This is one of those ones. Uh, his name is going to be Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Verse 22, all of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet, which is Isaiah, 
<clears throat> Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, in the title of this message, which means God is with us. Come on, how many people are grateful that God is with us today in this service? Before you got here, God was here. We are grateful that God is with us. So there's two things that's going on in this passage that, that Matthew is trying to convey. The first one is that Jesus will be a savior. Verse 21, it says, and she shall have a son and you are to name him Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Come on, how many people know before healing, uh, before deliverance, before all of that stuff, what we really need is salvation from our sins, forgiveness of our sins, right? So that's the most important one that Jesus is going to come to this earth and he is going to do what no man could do. And that's fulfill every single requirement of the Old Testament law. Man, Jesus got it down. Amen. So Jesus is going to be a savior. The next thing that Matthew is trying to convey this underlining tone is that the prophet Isaiah's his passage would be fulfilled because how many people know that Jesus's whole life was fulfillment of prophecy? Over 300 prophecies, Jesus fulfilled every single one of them. And this is one of the, uh, the prophecies in Isaiah. Let's jump to Isaiah 7, verse 14. The word of the Lord reads. It says, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and we will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. <clears throat> we see this passage in the Old Testament in Isaiah. How many people have heard that passage before, Right. I think we've all maybe right, the first time we just heard it and we go to the Old Testament and we see it and it's exciting, right? Because that means that God is about to be with us. But whenever you unpack what's going on, come on, how many people know when, it, when you start bringing context, everything changes, right? So what, what's happening is that there's the, the southern part of Israel, they call it Judah, is under persecution. The northern tribes, Assyria, this is 700 years before Jesus ever even walked this earth. Right. His name was King Ahaz, the, the, the southern part of Israel. Um, they call it Judah. We have the northern tribes. We have Assyria. They're all coming down to to lay siege, to besiege, um, to, to lay siege Judah. They're all coming against them. And Ahaz is not a real godly man. Right. Like King David was. And, and how many people know that even though these kings, these men were not extremely faithful, they made mistakes, they were fearful, they were sinful at times, and they turned their back on God, God never turned their back on them. Come on, how many people are grateful that God never turns his back on us? And whenever you are, when, when you're not faithful, it doesn't change God from being faithful, right? The Bible even says whenever you try to disown God, God doesn't disown you because God cannot disown himself. His spirit is on the inside of you. Oh, come on, somebody. So, so Ahaz would not have listened to God at that time, right? He didn't have a personal relationship with God. And you have all of these northern tribes and you have Assyria all coming down to lay siege and try to take out the, the southern part of Judah. So God speaks to his prophet Isaiah and tells Isaiah to go tell King Ahaz, listen, I know you got opposition all around you, but this is all I want you to do. Keep silence because I'm going to go before you and I'm going to take this enemy out. Come on, how many people know that sometimes you just got to stay silent, amen, and let God do the talking, right? If we could just learn a lesson from right here, just to remain silent, could we open up our mouth and start messing up some stuff? And all the men said, amen, amen. right? You won the argument already, and, then you, and you're walking away, and you're like, it's just that every time. Like, just be quiet, my bro. <laughs> so God tells him. Right. God tells them that you're about to uh, they're going to lay siege against you. There's going to be war that's going to break out. There's devastation. There's destruction. But just take heart. Understand that God's hand is going to be with you through all of this. Come on. How many people can say that they've been through some stuff in their life? But you, you still know that God was with you through it all. Hey, the devil should have took you out when he had a chance because you showed up to church this Sunday. Come on, now you're about to pray. Praise God for a breakthrough in your life. And so, so God tells Isaiah to, to tell him, to test me on this. I'll give you a sign. I'll give you a sign to prove to it that I'm about to deliver you and, and the nation of, or, or Judah from the nation of Israel and all the other northern tribes. And this is what he tells him. He says, look, this is going to be the sign, right? That, that there's going to be a virgin. She's going to conceive a child. In other words, I'm about to deliver you right now, but the real breakthrough is going to come in the future whenever I see in Jesus, the savior of the world, because you might need deliverance right now from a physical circumstance, but the real deliverance that you need is the salvation of your soul from your sins. And only Jesus could do that. No prophet could do that. Nobody could do that. So it was in the darkest time of their life. They were surrounded by enemy opposition. Have you ever felt like that before? 
right? You may not have even been, but in your mind, it felt like you, you could not. You finally go to sleep, and by the time you go to sleep, your, your mind starts racing, and you become your own worst enemy, right? You are surrounded on all fronts from every single person, just like these people were. So, and God still gives them a sign of hope. How many people are grateful for hope? Amen. So what does that mean for us? Well, what it meant for them is exactly what it means for us. God is with us even when it doesn't feel like it. <clears throat> Try to make it plain. <clears throat> because sometimes we feel like we need a feeling in order to have God. Have you ever been in a season where you couldn't feel God? And you thought you were disconnected from God? But God was with you all along? Look, check this out. Before you were even saved and denied God, God was with you. How much more that you're a Christian and going through a dry season that God is with you? He was with you when you were cursing him, blaspheming, acting a crazy person that you still are in Jesus' name. You're still, healing is coming, amen, healing. Bubba's was over there laughing at me. <laughs> God is good, amen. So if he was with you in your darkest times, whenever you weren't even a Christian, how much more is he going to be with you now that you are serving him? So it's not all about feelings that God is with you even when you don't feel it. I heard this quote. It says the presence of pain does not mean the absence of God. Because sometimes you're going through a real struggle in your life. You're going through a real pain in your life and you feel because you feel pain and you feel struggle and you cannot associate this pain with God because whenever you think about God, you think about blessings, you think about breakthrough, you think about Holy Spirit pouring out. How could it be that I have all this pain in my life and God could still be with me? Just because you feel pain does not mean that God is not with you. I want to tell you this, that's how you know God is really with you. You know, whenever it says that we go from glory to glory, Right, glory to glory. We always think that that is just some kind of just like, oh, from, from, from one ultimate high to the next of Christianity. But how many people know that there's two valleys for every mountaintop? So sometimes the glory that God is getting, even though that you were down in the valley feeling like giving up and you did not give up and you depended on God, that is moving from glory to glory because you became more like God. The Bible says that you're going to suffer and, and the suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character. So maybe God knows something about suffering. Amen. And, and, and following Jesus, how many followers of Jesus do we have here today? And if you are not a follower of Jesus, today is the day to become a follower of Jesus. And, but, but one thing we got to make extremely clear is because you become a follower of Jesus does not mean that you are going to live a storm-free life. Maybe you lived a storm-free life before you got saved. Well, get saved and watch how fast the storm comes. Because Jesus is calling the disciples. He's saying, follow me, follow me. And then we want to follow you. And he said, Docs, uh, foxes don't have dens and there's nowhere to, uh, for the son of man to lay his head. In other words, there's no rest for us in the kingdom of God. There's no rest. We're always pressing in and pressing through and getting persecuted. And he said, well, follow me. And he's like, you don't understand how hard it is. Because how many people know that there's a cost to discipleship? Salvation is free. Thank you, Jesus. And it's free because you, you wouldn't be able to pay for that. But the cost of following Jesus is going to cost you, right? And sometimes it's suffering and sometimes it's pain. Jesus told the disciples right after that, after telling them to, to, uh, to, to follow me, yes, there's going to be persecution. Yes, there's going to be suffering. But they say, Jesus, I still want to follow you. Because your ways are better than my ways. Your thoughts are better than my thoughts. It's higher than I your thoughts are higher than I've ever been. Thank you, God. <laughs> Sorry, thank you, Jesus. All right. We're going to use second service, amen? No, I'm just playing. Jesus said, get in the boat, and we're going to go to the other side. And if Jesus says, I'm going to the other side, what's going to happen? We're going to get to the other side. And sometimes we forget what Jesus said because of what we see. And what we see should never change what God said. What God said should change what we see. And if you believe what he said and you speak that, then what you see will start to change to what he said because they all got in the boat and they all didn't do the same thing because they got into the boat to go to the other side. And what happens when Jesus says we're going to the other side? We're going to the other side. But Jesus did not say we're going to the other side and it's going to stay calm the whole time. 
Jesus did not say that if you follow me, everything is going to be easy. Matter of fact, he says, in this world, you will have troubles, trials, but take heart. I have overcome the world. In other, word, in other words, one thing that I guarantee you that we all have in common is that we have a calling on our life and we're all going to go through trials in our lives. They all get into the boat, and all of a sudden, here comes a storm. It shouldn't happen, though, right? Because we're following Jesus. And he said, we're going to the other side, but now here comes the storm. And this is why, if you're not rooted in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, what's going to end up happening is that whenever the storm comes, you're going to start doubting your relationship with him. Because now here comes the storm. The, the Bible says a ferocious storm. The, the winds and the waves are knocking the boat from, from side to side. And guess where Jesus is? Asleep. You're sleeping on me, Jesus, right? Jesus is asleep. They wake him up. Master, master, don't you care that we're about to drown? Can you imagine waking up Jesus, the, the maker and the creator of all things? And now there's a storm that we're facing. And Jesus, if you really care about us, you're going to wake up and you're going to make this storm go away. He gets up. He looks at them, throws his pillow, bah, hits him. No, Jesus was in the stern. It looked like he was asleep, but he was watching Dallas Cowboy highlights win the game. I'm just playing on his phone. He wakes up. I, I, can you imagine what he looks like at them? Like, and the Bible says that he rebukes the winds and the waves, and then he addresses them. What I want to tell you is sometimes you have to address the environment before your people will ever listen. Until you remove your child from the fear, from wherever it is, they're not going to have the right mind to listen, right? If you always try to resolve the marriage conflict in the middle of the storm, you're not really going to have a lot of progress. Sometimes we need to address this, bring the peace in the house, and then both of us need to see eye to eye. Jesus rebukes the winds and the waves. Then he tells them, oh, ye of little faith, where is your faith? And then the Bible says that the, that the disciples, they look, that who is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? The maker and the creator of this universe, that's who. And you know what he tells them? When, when they're, they're panicking and freaking out, there's a storm. I'm looking at my circumstance. I'm looking at my problems. Master, master, don't you care that we're all about to drown? Jesus wakes up, calms the winds and the waves. Oh, ye of little faith. This is, this is what I've learned about faith. The, I heard this in a song, so I can't take credit for it. The opposite of faith isn't doubt. It's having everything figured out. Because sometimes we think that we have to have everything figured out in life. God's a God of order, so everything needs to be perfect. And if I'm going to get to the other side, then there should not be a storm. Because Jesus is in the boat with us. It should be perfect. But how many people know that this life is not going to be perfect? Right. Sometimes God is going to call you to do some even something, even when you don't have the money, even when you don't have the finances. That's what depending on God is all about. It's not about having everything figured out. Sometimes that is probably some of the biggest or, or, or the most difficult stumbling block for Christians is feeling like they have to have everything figured out in order to follow God. If you have everything figured out, why do you need faith? If God gave you the whole plan, then would you need faith to trust him with it? He doesn't give you the sentence, he just gives you a word. And sometimes a word for that season is all you need in order to go to the next place. So he's, he's challenging them. But yet God is with us through it all, even when it doesn't feel like it. Even in a storm, even in a battle, even through a divorce, through a bankruptcy, through sickness, through cancer, God is still with us. And since it's Christmas time, and we're giving away presents. I want to say our greatest presence, our greatest present to others is being present with them. I believe one of the greatest presents that you can give somebody else is just being present and being there for them. Because a lot of people know what it feels like to have nobody around you. Well, sometimes God will have you in that season of wilderness with nobody around you so you can have empathy when somebody else is going through that same exact situation. Matthew 28, 20 says, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. If Jesus says that and be sure of this, you can be sure of this. And be sure of this, I am with you. What does it say? Sometimes, right? Whenever the lake is clear, 
right? It's always, he says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus is with you always. This is a foreign concept to people. How could Jesus be with us always? Because in the Old Testament, if you wanted to go to God, you had to go to an altar. You had to go to a, a, a tabernacle or a temple or an altar. If you wanted God, you had to bring a sacrifice and go meet God, right? So how could it be that God is going to be with me always? Well, Jesus is saying, I'm going to come down to earth. I'm going to die for you in three days. I will be raised up again. I will send, ascend to heaven. 50 days later on the day of Pentecost, my Holy Spirit will pour out in each and every one of you. And if you call on my name, you will be saved. My Holy Spirit will be on the inside of you. And I will be with you always through the storm, through the trial, through the battles, through the sickness, through everything that you face in your life. God is saying, and be sure of this, because I go away. My Holy Helper is going to come back and I will be with you forever. I will be with you always. And we can praise God for that. Because you can start to imagine how Mary was feeling, right? She was a young woman. Can you imagine? I think sometimes we hear these stories so many times. We see the nativity scene, and we have these, this, this story that's told like it's just, oh, she, she got pregnant by the Holy Spirit, and, and, and then everything was good, and her family all understood exactly what was happening, and everybody was on the same page. But how many people know that sometimes... God's perfect plan does not make sense to imperfect man. Because I prom I guarantee you, I don't know for sure because I wasn't back then, but I'm put, trying to put the pieces together here. I'm pretty sure that it threw a lot of people off, including Mary. Can you imagine being young, young as she was, and then an angel appears to her? In that custom, a woman wasn't even allowed to talk to a man without her husband or an older brother. Can you imagine how much she panicked when this creature, this angel, is there speaking to her, saying that you're about to, to have a child and the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you, and that's how you're going to have your baby. Can you imagine? She's, think about what this young girl was feeling, this young woman at the time, that you are about to be pregnant by God, and you're going to have a baby, and you're going to name him Jesus. And then she goes to tell her husband, Joseph, Joseph's like, what are you talking about? You're pregnant by God. No, you're not. And every young girl would have been taught the rule that's in the Old Testament law in Deuteronomy, that if you are engaged to another man or to a man and you have a baby by another man, that you are to take to the town gate and be stoned to death. Let the, the gravity and the weight set in of what Mary was facing. I'm about to be killed for this. I'm about to die for this. And she's trying to get it all together. And if you read the passage, the Bible says that, and Joseph decided to quietly divorce her, right? I know Joseph was perplexed. He was struggling. He was battling. He probably went to the local synagogue and talked to the, the rabbi there, the rabbi who would have done their wedding and probably got some counsel and reviewed the scriptures together and, and either we stone her to death for what happened or you can just disown her. And in, in, this, in this day and age that these families, the, these uh, marriages were arranged before babies were ever even born. The families would unite and to, to network and to, to bring resources together. Just like the kings, they would, they would have wives with, or how David would have a wife with the king of Egypt for a political alliance. There's, in, in, in this day and age, they were like, okay, there's a family here, there's a family here, and your sons and daughters are going to marry my sons and daughters, and we're going to have a family, and we're going to build together. So if a young woman was now pregnant, not by her husband, but by God, she didn't just disgrace and, and bring shame on her family, but Joseph's family as well. And so Joseph's getting counsel. I don't know what to do. I don't want to kill her. I'm not going to kill her. I'm not going to have her, have her stoned, and I'm not going to bring her out in, into the public and disgrace her, uncover her like that in front of everybody. Um, but I'm going to secretly divorce her. And so he starts going on this path. And on and, and this passage alone, it says, and then the angel told him not to. But if you read a parallel passage in the book of Luke, it says after this happened, she suddenly, all of a sudden, she grabs her stuff and she books it to go see her cousin Elizabeth. You know what's happening? She was just told that she's about to get divorced. 
And she knows the Mosaic law says that she's supposed to be stoned and that she cannot go to any of her family because she has brought shame to her whole entire family. So she grabs the stuff and the Bible says that she suddenly, she takes off to go see her cousin Elizabeth who six months before got visited by an angel, Gabriel, and said that you're about to have a baby as well, even in your old age. Come on, how many people know we serve a God of miracles? We serve a God of miracles. And so now you have a young Mary on the run, not knowing where to go. She can't go to her family. She's, she can't go to her husband. She has nowhere to go. But instead, she's going to go to see somebody who's going through the same thing that she's going through. An unexpected pregnancy. A divine pre pregnancy. And here she is, and the Bible says that she stays with Elizabeth for three months or until she has the baby, and then she's coming home. You go back to Matthew, and then the Bible says, and then the angel of the Lord told him that this baby is from God. This is the Savior of the world. Don't be afraid to marry her. He comes back. He's changed his mind. God spoke to me too, because how, how many people know that if God's going to speak to one in the marriage, God's going to speak to the other as well. And he said that we're both going to ride this thing out together. But what we see is that Elizabeth was there for Mary in a time of need. Sometimes our greatest gift to other people is just being present sitting in the pain with them, letting them talk about it, letting them deal with it. And God will often bring you to like-minded people going through the same thing, imperfect people serving a perfect God, moving in that direction. This is why we have church community. This is why we have life groups. So people can come around, talk about what they're going through, battle together, cry together, go through what they're going through together. And we see how God would bring two people together, that they would be present there with them. Sometimes we can get so busy celebrating Christmas that we fail to celebrate Jesus. And I believe that our greatest present to God is being present with God. Some of our greatest presence with other people is being there for them. But I think there's no money, there's no amount of offering. There's no amount of obedience that you could give to God other than just being present with God. I heard this story of a kind of a wealthy CEO, an executive. It was uh, Christmas and his daughter wanted a, a, a dollhouse. And so he may or no, he gets his daughter a, a, an expensive five hundred dollar dollhouse and he spends all day putting it together and you know, Two, three story, big one, spends all days frustrated. Finally, at the end of the day, he goes and gets his daughter and he tells baby girl, I put the dollhouse together, but she's been messing with the packaging. She has a little cardboard stick that it came with and she's over there playing swords with it. And whenever he was finally done with the house, the dollhouse, the playhouse, his daughter gives him another cardboard. And she said, come on, daddy, let's play swords. He just spent $500 and all day long on a dollhouse, and all she really wants to do is spend time with her father. I started thinking, like, there's been so many times that I remember when my daughter was like five years old, and I'm sitting on the couch, and she has a little dress on, and she runs, she was listening to something on her iPad, and she runs up to me, and she was like, Daddy, she was like, check out this new dance that I have. And I look at her, and I say, go ahead. And she was like, no, no, never mind. It's okay, Dad. She goes, I'll come show you whenever you're done writing your sermon. And I was like, I don't have a pen to pad out. I don't have my iPad, nothing. I said, baby, how do you know that I'm writing a sermon? And she was like, I always know when you're writing a sermon. You're like this. I shook it off. And I'm like, no, you're not going to show me la later, baby girl. You're going to show me right now. I'm present now. If a five-year-old girl can tell when her father is not present, think about how much more our father in heaven knows when we're not present with him. We're reading scriptures, thinking of something else, worshiping in church, thinking of something else, someone else, some other problem. And I believe that sometimes God just says, you know what? If you just take a deep breath some mornings, Read a passage and just close your eyes or take a deep breath and just get present with God. I believe that that is more pleasing to God's heart than any action and any work and any amount of offering that you can give. Just simply being present with your father. I believe that God 
has everything that you could ever want or imagine. There's nothing that he needs but desires us being present in our worship, present in our prayer, present with a living God. Question is, how many people have wanted the presence of God but were afraid to come to God because there's something you did not want to bring up to God? And you feel that if you get too close to him, he's going to figure everything out that you've been hiding or holding back or struggling with. The truth is God already knew all about it all along. And I don't believe that God wants us to to be afraid to come to him. I believe that through everything that you face in life, in the middle of all of that is when you really need to go to him. Not run away, not to listen to the devil's voice saying, oh, here you are, a hypocrite, coming again and again and again. How many people have ever felt like that before? But the scripture says in Hebrews 4.15, this high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. And we look at Jesus as being perfect, right? And we're like, well, we'll never be able to to get like that. We'll never be able to be like that. But Jesus went through every single thing that we went through so we can look to him to help us get through those same things. You have people saying things. You have people doing things. You have people, whatever it is, we, we feel this. But Jesus felt that too. There was a time that he was verbally sparring back and forth with the Pharisees. And, and he was saying that my father this, and, and Jesus was saying my father that. And then the Pharisees, I never really caught it until just this round of, of studying. The Pharisees go, our father is Abraham. Right? We know who our father is. Who is your father, Jesus? In other words, we know how your mom was. We know what happened. We know your mom got pregnant a long time ago, and y'all try to say it was from God, but it was really somebody else. She, and then the Pharisee goes, we're not illegitimate children, you are because they know what happened with Mary because she got pregnant by just God. She like, Oh, you made that up. You're not God. No, you don't even know who your father is. Jesus. Can you imagine having that kind of word said to you when you know the truth and you're still having to press forward, even though people are saying things about you. Jesus is like, I already experienced all that. And I made it out on the other side. So what I believe is Jesus is showing us that we could, that the fact that God is with us, we could be with God, be present with him, be present with others, no matter what we face in our life. How many people are grateful for a God like that? No matter what we go through in our lives, he is with us. Father, we thank you, God, for your word. We thank you for being with us. And we're asking for a supernatural assistance from your Holy Spirit to help us slow down, God and be present in this moment, that we don't forget what Christmas is all about. The real gift is you, Jesus. So help us be present with you and help us be present with others through their trials, their struggles, and their shame. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching, and we hope you received a life-changing word from God today. Make sure you stay up to date on any new content by subscribing to this channel. Outreach, discipleship, and leadership is our mission here at RISE and we want you to be a part of it. So click the link in the description below to get connected with us. Also in the link, you'll be able to give your tithe and offering, which is being used to grow this ministry that God is using to build this kingdom. God has used our sacrificial giving to completely transform broken people into mighty men and women of God. The Lord is raising the next generation of leaders today. So we thank you so much for your generosity, and we will see you next week.